Freedom Island. I'm here on the side porch where there's a lot of cars going by on the Monday after Memorial Day. It's a good thing the rest of the family isn't here because they would be wanting to know why I would be out doing this. They still think I'm doing notes from a caseworker with all the cars going by. I remember one of Daddy's jokes is he used to say that the reason they called it Indy 500 was 500 people forgot where they parked and they was driving around and around and around with their friend trying to find, you know, their own car. So the big race is over and uh, a lot of the people have gone home and then a few people are stretching out their Monday because they're not quite ready after the weekend to get started again in life, I guess, and I don't blame them. Everybody here went to a cookout and they invited me and uh, I said I I didn't want to go. They're teasing me because they think I'm a fraidy cat about COVID, which they all had, you know, fairly recently. And I said it wasn't about being a fraidy cat. It was about allergies and the lilacs is all out now and I can't breathe through my nose. They said take a Zartac or Zartac or whatever it's called and I said, I like Karen and Steve, all right, but not enough to get all hyper from taking decongestant. (laughs) I think they understood that. I think they thought that was a pretty honest answer. So off they went, and that way I don't have to explain why I'm out here on the noisy porch instead of in the house. But my brother got one of those Alexas or a Siri or I don't know which one is which one, but he got one of them boxes that you talk into and it tells you what the temperature is outside or I think it makes the TV channel or the radio come on and things like that. People tell me that if the light ain't on it's not recording but how can it hear you? I mean it's supposed to be that you say the name of it and then the light comes on and that means it can hear you but it seems to me like if somebody wanted to put something in your house to listen to you they could fix the light however they wanted it to be. I quit recording or doing anything in the house because I could tell that Lauren was looking at my laptop. Uh, It was set up funny. The last time I left it on my bed, folded up and didn't take it with me, and then I come back, and it wasn't folded up quite the same way. I usually do closed up the same way. And I could tell she'd had it open, and I don't know what she was looking for, but I'm smart, and I sent it all as email attachments, my files, and then I deleted it off that laptop. I might have been silly and forgot and left my laptop at home, but I wouldn't be silly enough to leave a file on there and then leave it at home, because I know I might forget it, right? I don't trust none of them. Last time I made one of these logs, I was talking about how my plan is to go up to Detroit, take a bus up there, and I've got a lady I know that has a vacant house up in the neighborhood where Uncle Boyce and some of his hanger-ons and his prison buddies and stuff is at a what's supposed to be a program to help people learn job skills you know for when they get out of prison but there's quite a bit more going on over there the last time I made one of these recordings I was talking about how I'm going to go up there and I talked about how I got on the internet you know I had my uh, macrame and crochet channel that I made on YouTube and then I used that account to request to get in on the like the subgroup I guess you'd say of these people that Uncle Boyce follows on YouTube and he had already had a lot of extreme type stuff that he was putting on YouTube and then I realized there was even worse stuff that you can't put on the public channel but if you like subscribe privately you can get access to some of these videos that are more private you know, for a select audience, and then also they told me where that website is, and I thought it was going to be a big CIA, you know, KGB secret spy, you know, and it just turned out to be a dumb website that they made with free software, but whatever. So I mentioned last time that some stuff I had seen on there had made me really move up my plan to go to Detroit, see what I can find out about what they're doing. Am I a spy? No. Do I know anything about surveillance? No. Uh, Just dumb stuff I've seen on TV and movies. But here's the thing is, you know, I've said this before, so I don't need to keep saying it, but nobody who knows how to do it is going to do it until something bad already happens. And I'm not a person that I can convince anybody 
to listen to what I'm saying because I've got opioid conviction and I had that other little stir up of legal trouble where I was holding on to some stuff from my brother in my car and he didn't have the receipt for all of it. They did drop it, but they knew about it, you know, the police and the, and they know our family and where we live at and all that stuff. And I feel like we're pretty good people, mostly with some mistakes, but not everybody sees us that way. And also, if you talk a certain way and you live a certain place, they can't tell my family apart from people that's just nothing but a den of thieves and major drug dealers and doing all kinds of nonsense that we grew up around it, but we'd always sidestep all that stuff. We weren't that kind of people. Mom and Daddy for sure wasn't, and us kids were a lot better than most of them, you know, that we could have run around with. If you are in a police car and you pass somebody that dresses like we dress and live where we live, and our name is kind of like a similar, you know, we use the kind of names, old-fashioned names like that people we grew up with had, you know, because we're named after our aunts and uncles and Bible names and whatnot, and, um, to them, we're all just one big group. And also then, if you make a little mistake of some kind, it's ten times more than if you weren't from around here and went to where we went to school and where we live at. You know, somebody else could do exact same thing that we do. And that's just a little mistake they made. But if we do it, then it's the crime of the century. And I'll tell you something else. They don't believe nothing you tell them. They see it as an excuse uh, or, you know, like that we're denying mistakes or they don't think we can think. They think we're adult in the head and on drugs and everything else. So that's what I think they think they think. But underneath that, we live with a lot of problems that they don't want to know those problems because if they knew them and then they were held accountable for it and it would be their problem, they don't want it. The people aren't going to give them the tax money or the hiring or any of the things they would need to make stuff better here. The people who don't live here think what we get is good enough for us. They think we're ignorant, so a bad school is just good enough for us. They think we have loud, hillbilly, you know, ruined cars, so a bad road's good enough for us. They think we're just going to get in trouble and get put in jail anyway, so a job that ain't going to go anywhere is good enough for us because there's no point in investing in us because in five years or ten years we're going to be in jail anyway. That's the way they think about us. They don't want to give us nothing, and they don't want to hear about the problems we have. So, of course, when we talk and we try to tell what's going on, they don't want to hear it, but at the same time, if you don't tell them every single thing that every cousin you had and what they did and when they did it and when they ate a sandwich and if they paid for it, then you're withholding information from them. You can't win, you know, with them. The thought of trying to... I had thought about writing down some of what I know and put it in a letter or email it or something. And I'm not going to email it because I don't want to have it get back to me. And I don't even know anymore how they can get your DNA off of stuff. I, I don't want to sound like a crazy person. But I saw some story on a, like one of those true crime shows on TV where some lady said that people were sending her death letters or scary letters or whatever. And it was all a plot she was doing against somebody else. And they figured it out because she licked the envelope and they got her DNA off the envelope. And that was a long time ago that that happened. So they can probably, I don't know, if you breathed in the air where the envelope was, maybe your microbes stuck to the envelope or something. Even if I wasn't worried about that, even if I thought, okay, I could go somewhere and write it all down. They're not going to listen to anonymous. They're going to think you're like a crackpot. To get listened to, you have to put your name, your address, your phone number, and so on. And as soon as they know it's me or anybody with our family's name on the envelope or whatever, that's going to be the end of the story. So the only thing I can do is I have to get proof. I have to have a picture or a video or a document or a recording or numbers or a, I don't know what I need. Cars, license plates. I don't even know. I don't even know how to be a spy. I don't know what is even good evidence. And I don't know how to get it without having somebody see me and all that stuff. So 
it's pretty uh, overwhelming to think about me trying to go up there on a bus, stay in some house I've never been in, find my way around, and solve this disaster before it happens. But I'm scared to death. People are going to get hurt. And I don't see anything else except for me to go. So last time when I was talking about all this stuff, I didn't say much about what I saw because... I was kind of laughing and making fun of them because their website was so lame and all that stuff. But I was being like that because it's so weird and so scary. It's not like it's gruesome or gory or disgusting or anything like that. It's more like I understand it too good. Like, I can see how their mind is to make this race war and this terrorism and this guns and you know, uh, taking over the government and all that stuff, I can see where they get it from. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm not saying that I think they're right. I think they're crazy and they got everything all messed up and twisted around and they got their own agenda and stuff. But I'm just saying, if you're from where I'm from and you grew up with the kind of families we had and where we went to school and church and different problems people have had and what they talk about when they're in anybody except people like us around, you know what they're really like and what's really real, not how they act when there's other people that's from outside here. And you can tell if people are serious and what they think they really think or if it's just big talk. And I can tell you what, some of the stuff that I'm about to try to Put together to make like a list or a plan to think about what I need to get information about. I can tell you the people that's around here that has things to do with this. It's not just like a thing they thought up yesterday or just something they saw on the internet or a conspiracy of the week or something like that. This is for them it's real and it feels like a truth. Like it feels down deep like they feel like they understand things, that it all makes sense and it all clicks together in their mind. And if you're not from here, you would say, well, that doesn't make sense, which I've had people say to me before. You know, I went to community college a little bit and I met some people there when I took some classes and they won from where I'm from. At some point, I don't remember what we were talking about, but I was trying to tell these people, I was taking culinary science to learn how, you know, you do a food presentation for like hotels and hospitality, you know, catering and things like that. So I was getting in culinary arts. And so we, you know, we talk because we're cutting up things in the kitchen and doing our cleanup and all that stuff. When you got a lot of busy work to do, you know, you chat, 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 as long as, especially if the teacher's just not right in your part of the room right then. And I don't remember how it came up. I think it was some movie that was on TV or something. And one of the people didn't know what Armageddon was. They didn't understand what it was supposed to be. I said, you don't know what that is? And they said, no. And I said, like, Book of Revelations and all that. And they kind of knew a little bit, but they said, was it the end of the world? And I said, well, eventual, you get to where there's no world anymore and everything's up in heaven or hell. But there's a long time on the earth that all the tribulation and all that, and they didn't understand even what I meant. They looked at me. I was talking about my parents. They looked at me, and they were like, who would teach that to children? And I was like, well, they taught it to us because they truly believed it was a real thing, that the end of days was coming, and the ones that would be saved from the tribulation and all the terrors on tortures on the earth would be the people that have found salvation. And my mom and dad believed it was going to come in our lifetime. And it didn't come in their lifetime. They passed away and it didn't happen. But their preacher, my dad really wouldn't go, but I say their preacher, but the church they belonged to, but daddy never went, but she went. They taught it in church that it would be in our lifetime. So 20 years, 40 years away, they knew us kids, they might be gone, but us kids would still be alive on the earth. And they wanted to save us from it. Just like if you were in a war, like in London, when England got bombed by Germany. You know, the Germans was bombing the city parts where they could do the most damage to their manufacturing and their weapons and their food and so on, right? 
that's where the mothers and fathers would take their kids and they put them on a train, a little gas mask and a little overnight bag. They sent their kids off with strangers, more or less. Or, you know, I mean, they were like welfare people, but they didn't really know those people well. And they sent them on a train to go out farther away, out in the country, because the Germans still bombed out there, but it was more like random-like, whereas... In London, they might knock down a whole street, a school. They, you know, they didn't care if children were asleep in their beds or whatever. Kill your dad, right? So the parents would do a pretty drastic thing because it was a war. You know, if you said to somebody in peacetime, "I want you to put your children on a train and send them out in the country with people you don't even know," people would think I'm not going to do that. But when bombs are coming down and blow up the building right across the road from where you live. You know, and your children are scared to death and they can't sleep and pale looking and you are too and everybody's snapping at each other and you don't know if there's going to be stuff to eat or, of course, you're going to put your children on there. My parents believed in Armageddon and and Revelations and stuff and they thought it was a real thing that was for sure going to happen. Of course, they scared us with movies and describing how terrible it would be to be on the earth before the day of judgment and all that stuff. So I just stopped talking about it in this class, this culinary class, because that woman had just shut her mind to it. She was like, well, nobody could believe that. That's just crazy. Like that somehow my parents were the only ones that believed that. And I thought, I hate to break this to you, but they are Southern Baptists and Indianapolis is full of Southern Baptists. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of them here. And if you go down south in Kentucky and West Virginia and Pennsylvania, which I know it's not really south, but you know what I mean, and and you go farther south and stuff like that, there's Southern Baptists everywhere. There's regular Baptists and Southern Baptists. And the Southern Baptists absolutely think everything that I just said is a real thing that's going to happen. There's not just thousands, but there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, probably, Southern Baptists, and that's what they all think. And the Pentecostals think it, and there's other ones that believe it, too. And that's what this group of people that Uncle Boyce and these other people are using. They're using the Bible, not really the Revelations part, more like the early parts of the Bible. They're using the Holy Book to explain why they're willing to do really drastic things, Another person that's not from where we're at would think it sounds crazy, but it would make sense if you got raised the way we got raised. They would give examples of all of the invasions and the when the Moses and the people came to Canaan. There was already people living in Canaan. The Canaanites were already there. Well, they couldn't. Moses' people and the Canaanites, there wasn't enough land. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough anything there for everybody. Nobody wants to say it, but Moses told the people to go to Canaan, and what he meant was to go to make war. He didn't go with them, but the rest of them went. And people talked about, like, God giving them Canaan, like, you know, the way he gave them manna. But the manna just fell down from the sky, or was the pollen on the plants, or however, whatever you think the manna was. But God sent them food, or or they found food, and they didn't have to do nobody any harm to get that. But you don't get land without doing harm. Because wherever anybody goes and they want to live there, somebody else already lives there. Unless it's so hot, you burn up. Or if so cold, you freeze to death. But if... If you can even halfway stand to live there and there's some water or some way to catch your rain or whatever, somebody lives there and they are not going to want to move because you decided you want to live there. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that's how the reality of it was. And then they just make it be, this is what God has ordained. So he has helped you smite your enemies and all that stuff. That's what we all grew up with. So it makes sense, kind of. And the other part of it is it don't make any sense. If you didn't really get a good education, and we didn't, and you didn't have good schools, and we didn't, and if you had to leave school or half pay attention to school because you were already halfway at work, you know, when you were already going to school, which is what happened to us, you don't get that much education anyway. And the Bible's all jumbled up, and it's all confusing and it's in a way where it's not like regular English it's old-fashioned and everything 
there's visions in it and there's all kinds of crazy things happen in it so if your mind's not perfectly in good order and you don't have a whole bunch of knowledge of history and what happened in, in the war of 1812 and who was fighting who or the French and Indian War and all that stuff we had in school, if, you, if you're not real clear on all that stuff, you can just dip in the Bible and pick out some particular... Because the people, even if they can't read, they want you to point to where you found it in the Bible so they know it's not coming from you, it's coming from the Holy Word. So you always see the preacher, you know, stand up and he'll wait till everybody finds it in their book. And even if they can't read, they can tell what page they're on. You know, they probably know at least some of the words, so they know you're in Ephesians or Deuteronomy or whatever. And they know their numbers, so it's 14, verse 2. And then they think, okay, I know that's right, and I know that's there. And that makes sense the way you think, if you were raised up with that, is that you just go randomly dip in like a well of knowledge. And it doesn't matter where you start or where you finish. It's You don't have to have it all in order like in a history book. You can just come in and grab some information. And as long as you've got your verse and your chapter and your source, that and everybody's got a copy of that book and they're holding it in their lap, whether they can read it or not. Most of them could read some, but you know, even if they were not a scholarly type person, they would feel like that's verified, you know? And so you don't have to have a real strong orderly mind to start feeling like you have understanding and that you can connect things together, even if it don't totally make sense. It's going to be appealing to you because you can say it's God's deep understanding and that maybe you're even special. Like, it's not because you're not making sense. It's because God's so majestic and so big and these things are so huge and it's so complicated and it's so mystical and it's so ordained and all. And maybe you have to be blessed or or have divine understanding inside you that another person doesn't have. You can go that way with it and you don't have to make sense to other people. If you're lost inside and you can make yourself a magical understanding and you're like a prophet or a a scholar that can understand things, and especially if what you've got to say happens to just fit perfect with the people that are listening to you, you can see how even stuff that don't make any sense at all is going to make more sense to you than the crazy stuff that's in the paper or you hear on the radio that doesn't even make any sense. And I know from what happened to mom, You can also have things in your brains where the electrical, you know, it's like chemicals and electricity together in your brain that makes the little, uh, you know, you see something and then you remember it. Or you, you remember how to use a tool or how to drive to and from work. You have these little jumps, you know, that goes from one part of your brain to the other part of your brain, connect it together. And people that have trouble with their mind or their brain, sometimes on chemicals or the electricity or there's a tumor or there's a material, fibrous material that's swelled up. There's a lot of things that could be wrong in your brain. Bacterias can get in there, you know, like that mad cow disease. Alcohol, like if you drink too much alcohol, you know, when we were kids, they used to say somebody was ate up and that's what they meant is that when you drink alcohol... It goes up in your brain and it makes a hole in your brain. Like there's a place where there should have been some brains and there ain't no brains there now. And when we were kids, when they would talk about people that drank a lot all the time every day. And after a while, even when they were sober, they didn't make no sense. And people would say he's ate up and that's what they mean. That they're like their brain's like a Swiss cheese on the inside with holes in it. When my mom started getting toward the end of her life. And she started getting confused in her thinking. Some of it, I think, was being old. And some of it was it kind of run in her family. And then some of it is, I think, some of the things she worked around, materials that she was around, both where she worked and where we lived, I think there was um, like mineral and metal kind of stuff in our food and our water. And, people from around where we're at get some of that that it co- incorporates up in your brain and it, it becomes part of you it's not supposed to be part of a human body but you just suck it up with you with your food and your you know the plants bring it up out of the ground you know if it fell down the 
the smokestack stuff that used to fall down and all that. And it goes down in the dirt, right? And then your plant pulls it up and then you eat your nice healthy spinach or your nice healthy broccoli. You don't realize you've brought some of that stuff up into your brain while you think you're eating something healthy. And I think some of that was what was going on with mom. They could tell from those tests, you know, at the laboratory that it wasn't jumping around the right way. So when she started getting kind of funny and confused, the one area where everything still made sense with her was about Bibles and having a Bible and reading the Bible and the right kind of Bible, where to get the Bible, which translation was the right Bible. That was something that would calm her down and it made sense to her. And then she just got like, my brother called it, Bible mania, which is like WrestleMania, only, you know, religious. Mom felt like she couldn't leave the earth until she had give each of us, kids and grandkids, the correct edition that would be like our guidebook to heaven, I guess. Because she felt like, you know, Daddy wasn't religious. He said he was, but you could tell it. He, he just went to do what he's supposed to do. I don't know what he really thought about any of it. He wasn't a talking about his thoughts and feelings kind of person. Mom always believed down inside of her. You could tell. She really always believed. She never had a moment of doubt. When she and her mind were starting to separate from each other, I think she could feel like she was like a balloon that was getting ready, the string was getting ready to untie and it was going to fly away and she wouldn't be with us to guide us. It felt to her like you couldn't just do it with any old Bible. You had to have the right one because it would like resonate with each of us. You know, the, the, the one we had would match who we were as a person. So we would have more of an affinity for it. And so we would take the text to heart and that way we could all be in heaven together. And she looked forward to that. That's what she wanted was us to all cross the River Jordan and meet on the happy shore and all be in heaven together. So when she started her Bible mania phase, as my brother would say, she gave me three or four different presentation Bibles and hippie Bibles. And uh, she gave me something that was called The Way that I, was it a Bible or was it a book about the Bible? I can't remember, but she thought I was some kind of a modern day hippie. And one of them was like, uh, it was like the way to heaven. So I had an arrow that went up and she thought maybe I could understand a hippie Bible. And then there was another time where she thought maybe I didn't think my Bible was pretty enough. And if I had a nice Bible, because, you know, I like to decorate a little bit. You know, I like my little knickknacks. I collect little china and porcelain, nothing worth anything. You know, it's just dime store, thrift store, flea market stuff. Oh, it ain't worth anything except just to me, but I like to collect little figurines and little funny things I see. And usually I get little white ones. It's just because really it all goes together. If you collect little blue things and green things and purple things and all that, if you've got a lot of time on your hands and a lot of energy to move things around, you can make little designs, I guess, with your colors and stuff and make them all go together. But that is harder for me to do, so I like to just get things that's basically white. Sometimes I have a flower painted on it or a little face if it's like an animal or a person. Like Le Choir Boy, you know, his songbook will be red or gold or black. Snowman, you know, he's got his orange carrot nose. There's a little flash of color here and there, but I like things that's mostly white. And then I can just put them any way I want on the shelf and it's all going to look all right. Maybe... She was thinking about that because it seemed real important to her to give me a white leatherette Bible that had Holy Bible in gold paint or whatever they put on the front of it. And then the edges of the pages were gold and then it came in a white box with a ribbon around it. It was gold. The presentation box, the paper was gold. And then the white and gold Bible was down in it. That was the first one she really gave me, I think before the hippie Bible. She had the sneaky look on her face like she thought it was going to be a surprise gift. And I mean, for one thing, she had Bible mania. And for another thing, there's really only one thing that looks like that. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> like a box that size. It's not going to be War and Peace, you know. It's going to be the King James Bible. She gave me this presentation Bible, and she wrote something on the inside cover. I can't remember what she wrote now. It was something that I, I knew what she was trying to say, is that she hoped my mind would find my way to the truth. And I tried telling her. I felt like it was too expensive. I'm afraid to even think what she paid for it. It might have been $40 or something like that. And she was on her fixed income. You know, I didn't want her laying out $40. I said, Mom, I still got my New Testament. Remember Mrs. Fisher gave me my New Testament because I learned all the books of the Old Testament in order and didn't make mistakes or make one mistake. Or I don't remember how she had us do it because, you know, I was in grade school. But I remember first I got, I think I did the New Testament first. And for that I got the plaque. She made us plaster plaques for us. And then you could paint them. And I had one that was of a Bible. It just made a plaster Paris. And she had like a kit. I mean, it was nice of her to make. I say just. It, it, there, it was nothing wrong with it. It was sweet of her. She had some kind of mold or kit that she got. She would mix up plaster of Paris and then make us one in and she'd embed a hook like a little round U hook at the top that was buried down in the plaster so you could hang it on the wall and it was uh, like uh, porous like so I had some watercolor paint I think I was about eight or nine or something and you had to know the books of the New Testament that's what you got for the prize and I remember mine was orange because I don't really like orange very much and I had um, praying watercolors and I had mostly orange because it's not a color I like very much. And being a, kind of impatient, I could have waited until I got some more paints and then chose what color to make it. But I painted the whole thing orange because that's what I had in my praying set. Then I tried to pretend like it was kind of aged paper. You know, I mean, it was really like kind of a popsicle orange. But, it, you know, it was watered down because it was in plaster, you know, and it was watercolors. But... uh I was in a hurry to paint it so I could put it on the wall. It looked like kind of a very faded orange popsicle or something. But I tried to pretend like it was antique paper, like it was very old book, like old manuscript. And then I hung it up on the wall. I wasn't that religious, but I was proud of getting a prize. And then I got the little New Testament. And then, you know, it's like a red leatherette to fit in your pocket or your purse. or Kind of too little to read, but the idea is you have it with you. So I told Mom I already had that, but... She wanted me to have this $40 white one in a box that she must have bought off the TV ministry or missionary thing or something. And then she gave me the hippie one. She gave me one or two other ones that was different translations. The more older she got and the more her mind got funnier and funnier, she would tell me that she was replacing. Like one she gave me wasn't the right translation. I should take that other one and wrap it up in a cloth and put it away in the closet. And then I should leave this one out. And somehow God would like energize it. Like she kind of thought God charged things up like a battery. So you put things out, not right in the sun, but like out in the open air. And it would get filled up with God energy. You know, if you had it out in your home. But if it was bundled up, then it would be kind of like sedate, you know. And it wouldn't do nothing. So that's what she wanted me to do with the old incorrect translation. I remember in that story of Rebecca, when she was pregnant with her twins, she was having a stomach, you know, not stomach problem, but like wound problems, you know. And one version of the Bible, God says that the two nations would arise from among her bowels. And then there was another one that said two nations would arise from her innards. So I think she would do something like that. She, Mom would get some idea that, that bowels was a nasty word or it was incorrect it wasn't even that it was a bad word but it was incorrect and if it said innards then that meant it was the right book and so she just picked something randomly out on some other page you know and however it was translated she would say that proves it's not divine so I think I got four Bibles total I've still actually got that little New Testament because I liked Mrs. Fisher she was nice she passed away and then I felt glad I had my little New Testament She'd be sad that she knew I never hardly opened it, but um, I have it. And then the other Bibles that Mom gave me, I kept those for a while after she died. But then I thought, you know who wants these is people in hospice. So I donated them because 
you know, sometimes people are not paying that much attention to their religious situation and then they get sick or they got a loved one that's getting sick and visiting there and they're always glad to have them. So I felt like that was a good thing.